Thank you for listening to the Mathetai Podcast. Before we start this episode, just a word of warning that this episode may contain issues that are sensitive to certain listeners. Uh, if you have younger children, you may want to preview this episode first uh, as we deal with sexual abuse and uh, the effects of that in an individual's life. And if you are a survivor of sexual abuse, this may bring up some emotions and struggles that you might want to be aware of, although we are offering hope and solutions through this episode. So God bless you in that, and we pray that this episode would encourage you and strengthen you as we learn about overcoming these trials and difficulties in our lives. Well, welcome to the Mathetai podcast. This is our special episode we call From the Deck, where we have special guests and we interview them and talk to them about their life experiences, uh, their uh, experience personally and their experience in ministry, what drove them to uh, Christ in the first place and how that's affected their adult life and how that shaped who they are as adults and then how that uh, shapes their participation in the church. And so today I'm joined by a special friend of mine. Uh, he is my former college roommate. Uh, so he has put up with me in many a season and with many things. And he has Likewise. written, <laughs> it's mutual. I'm sure. He's uh, written a couple of books now telling his story from a fictional standpoint, mm -hmm. um, but uh, with uh, some very powerful uh, insights uh, into, from his personal experiences and, and just from a, a, a storytelling perspective um, on a very important topic today, which we'll get into in just a little bit. But um, my guest is Harry Estes, and we'll go by Esty. Yeah. That's how I know you from college. And you're more than welcome to call me that. And so <laughs> throughout this, we can interchange. I'm fine with that. All right. So. All right. Fantastic. Well, we, we, ended, we were at uh, Whittier College together. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was your junior year, my sophomore year, that we roomed together. I my senior your year. Your senior yeah, year. my last year. There you go. So I, I ended your college career. It's <laughs> one way to put it, it isn't it? It was bad, though, but it wasn't bad. It was good. Well, it wouldn't be the first thing I've ended. <laughs> but, yeah, we had, we had a great time uh, rooming together, um, great uh, couple of years together uh, mm -hmm. at college and yeah. uh, ministering through the Christian club on campus there and um, just through experiencing life together for those couple of years. Mm -hmm. And um, um, it's been awesome to see what God's done with you and the family that uh, you have. And uh, you have your wife, Chrissy, and your three boys. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's been uh, great to see. Uh, how the Lord's moved you and directed you over these years. And uh, you're now a high school science teacher. Yes, and, and specifically I'm um, doing special ed science. Uh -huh. So I've narrowed down my focus just a little bit for that particular population. Okay. Um, although because I have multiple credentials, mm -hmm. I can do both special ed and regular mm -hmm. science too. So mm -hmm. I kind of flip around in the last 25 years, 26 years <laughs> I've been teaching. So. Yeah. Yeah. And is it uh, chemistry specifically that you're teaching or are you teaching multiple avenues of science? Well, in special ed, I'm doing more of uh, biology, physical science and earth science. Okay. So I haven't taught. It's funny because my <laughs> um, credential, my, my degree is biochemistry. Mm. Um, my credentials are biology and chemistry, but I've never taught a chemistry class before. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, go figure. That's, that's well, let, let's jump right into your story. Okay. Now you you grew up in Wyoming in a mm -hmm. small town. Yeah. And it's, it's, tell me a little bit about that. What what was your your life like growing up? Okay. Is it okay if I tell the name of the small town? Well, you, so, it's okay. up to you. Yeah, you're yeah, more than welcome fine. to. Because mm -hmm. most people, I mean, there's you know at the time there was five thousand people that lived in my town. So mm -hmm. um, it's uh, Warland, Wyoming, which was kind of in the middle of this the, um, base river basin. Um, so what that meant is in Wyoming that, you know, there's a bunch of farms and that's the, one of the main industries. So where I lived was actually a few miles outside of the main town. So I was in what's called, what would be called here a subdivision, I guess. Mm. Um, but it was really just about a handful of, uh, mobile homes that just kind of were plopped in the middle of some fields. Uh, we had corn, uh, sugar beets and barley mm -hmm. um both the sugar and the uh, barley went for beer because we had a coors plant 
Um, mm-hmm. The sugar also went for Pepsi because we had Pepsi, a Pepsi plant there, mm-hmm. which was the next two bigger industries. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the corn was for whatever. Um, it could be for um, livestock, whatever. So mm-hmm. if you can just imagine a small town, but then even smaller on the outskirts, that's kind of where I grew up. And um, it's it's a little different than California in that it's not quite as sandy dusty, but in, in some ways it is, right? Because um, it is kind of desert like. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we have some very very cold winters and some uh, periods of time where it's really really hot. And so that environment, I think, does play a huge part in um, my own experience as a child mm-hmm. and also. Um, being abused, sexually abused as a child. Mm -hmm. Um, Because of my isolation at such a young age from most of my peers who lived in town, there was a lot of stuff I had to kind of figure out on my own. Um, So most of my childhood was spent outside just kind of exploring by myself. Mm -hmm. So during the summertime when there was no school, we had acres and acres of Bureau of Land Management land to go explore and mm-hmm. I would go ahead and set off and, and do that. My dad was also a motorcycle shop owner and so we had some motorcycles that I would also use to go ahead and just find mm-hmm. places to go and keep myself entertained for hours. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that, that I think that's where some of the story part of me began to develop. Mm-hmm. I thought of Okay, so here I am driving, and I'm I'm out in this deserted land. So what kind of stories can I come up with? This, you know, what? How can I keep my mind also entertained? Yeah. So in my head, telling a lot of stories. Um, and so that's where where kind of the inspiration for some of these books has come. Your your storytelling ability has come from that childhood. It started there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah being able to to weave stories together. Right. Mm-hmm. And then just the inability to be able to really talk with other peers mm-hmm. or um, interact with them. Mm-hmm. So then writing little stories or, or you know, doing stuff to kind of keep my mind occupied was really important. Sure. Um, both my parents were, well, my, my father was really old. He was mm-hmm. 60 when I was born. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom was 35. Uh, my mom, however, never learned to drive. Mm-hmm. So with those two factors, they didn't really like going into town a whole lot to drop me off for however long and then come back and pick me up. Sure. So I was pretty much isolated to just friends during school time. Okay. Um, and there, in that little community with those mobile homes, you didn't have any other friends there. It was all families with no children. Yeah. A lot of them were older families, mm-hmm. um, you know, retired, mm. um, or families with no children Mm -hmm. or if there was one young man that was well boy that lived down the road but we were so different that we just never he had older brothers that he would hang out with and that was pretty much it yeah so yeah yeah, so that led that kind of isolation i think set up part of that Mm -hmm. um childhood sexual abuse just that isolation yeah um school also played a really good role. I, I think for me, school was um, my safe haven. Mm. Um, I was never a troublemaker. I kind of stayed under the radar for the most part. Um, school kept my mind occupied so I could do stuff. Um, I, I don't ever consider myself really smart, just very hardworking. Mm. And then whatever intelligence resulted from that, that's what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, but I could always rely on school. I could go there and I'd be there for a, a long time and I'd have engagement, I'd have places to, or people to talk with, places to be at, mm-hmm. things to do. And I think, and I may be biased, but mm-hmm. I think my education for Moreland was what was very top notch. Mm-hmm. I had um, great teachers who knew a lot, experienced a lot, were able to communicate that to me um, all through elementary school, junior high, and high school. Mm-hmm. So I really feel like the education was really good. And that also helped me to find a place to find some, some place to be, yeah. some place to fit in. Mm-hmm. Um, because mm-hmm. what was going on that I wasn't aware of as a young child is all of these, you know, childhood social interactions were taking place. They would also be reinforced outside of school mm. and I never had that mm-hmm. so when I would try to come into something you know just playing tag with with other people I didn't always 
feel like I fit in quite well enough because mm. the kids would play tag with it and we'd stop and they'd talk about what they did. You know, they went hunting that weekend or they went fishing that weekend or they spent time with this other family. Mm. And those were things I could never get involved with. Uh, so, they, so they had all these social activities that they were doing and, and, and things outside of school that they were doing with their families and, and other friends and you didn't have that yeah, in the exactly, same way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And again, I think that's mm. another, another one of those things that could fall under isolation, but mm. also, you know, yeah, I could be isolated, but I could still figure things out mm-hmm. socially, you know, but that wasn't happening for me either. Mm-hmm. So again, one of those things that kind of set, set the stage for that. Yeah. Um, I think another thing that set the stage is that I uh, matured really fast in junior high. Um, by the time I was 13, I was 5'10". Okay. <laughs> and so I towered over a lot of kids. I was already 160 pounds. Wow. So, mm-hmm. you know, I was big. I had a lot of adults mistaking me for 18 or older yeah. when I was 12 and 13. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that doesn't always happen to boys. It does sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I think having that those physical attributes mature so quickly without the my parents or anyone else saying okay this is what's happening in your life right it's okay you didn't have any guidance through all of that exactly yeah. that was really tough to yeah. try to, again figure out all that stuff on my own sure so you know when i met my perpetrator for my eighth grade year he and i'm not giving him an excuse mm. probably saw me as someone who was much older than i was sure so sure. initially okay <laughs> so there was that yeah uh, and then, you know, psychologically kind of going through the, the figuring things out on my own and not having really the capacity to put it all together because mm-hmm. that's an adult skill. Sure. Um, sure. Being able to figure out, oh, okay, this is a, uh, how I can, you know, manipulate or, or figure out this particular social interaction mm-hmm. and do it well and fit in and be normal. Mm-hmm. I didn't have those things. Mm-hmm. So I was constantly looking for older people to kind of guide me through that. My, my dad was, I don't want to say he was too old. He was too old <laughs> to really figure that out. And I think he, at that point, he was kind of worn out. Of okay. Just, you know, okay, I fathered you. And that's all I can do. Right. Know? Sure. Cause I have a younger brother too. And mm. so I think at that point he just was tired. Yeah. And my, my mother also had undiagnosed bipolarism. Mm. Um, and so there was that aspect mm-hmm, of, mm-hmm. okay, I don't have someone who's very stable that guides me through this. Right. Always looking for someone outside to, yeah. to, in my understanding at the time, just be there and just be a role model. Yeah. And so a lot of that fell on men who were my teachers. Like mm-hmm. I remember my eighth grade algebra teacher who I've written letters to a couple times just thanking him for the things mm-hmm. he did. He has no idea sure. what kind of impact he had on me at that point because... Mm-hmm. I mean, this was a, a strong male figure who, you know, was caring, compassion. I mean, he just had it all together. Yeah. And so to look at that was like, okay, that's what I what I needed in my life at that time. And that's a good word for teachers that are right now. That yeah. are hearing this. You have no idea the impact you're making on a child's life, that mm-hmm. where they're coming from, things that they've not shared. And your leadership and your instruction and care into their life might be a life-changing thing for them mm-hmm. that you will never hear about. Yep. So... Uh, I wish that teachers could get more things for that, but um, you know, sometimes it's years down the line that they may mm-hmm. hear about it. Sometimes they may never hear about it, but uh, they're never forgotten in that yeah. sense. So, yeah. yeah, so that's a good encouraging word for those who yeah, are teaching. Yeah, I hope it is because it, <laughs> yeah. it truly is that, that mm-hmm. this man probably will never know unless he hears this or mm-hmm. sees my name published, know what I went through yeah. and that he actually had a positive impact in that. Mm-hmm. Um, but there were other teachers too. My seventh grade PE teacher or my sixth grade PE teacher was mm-hmm. outstanding and mm-hmm. he just was a simple person, yeah. you know? So there's that lack of solid maleness mm-hmm. that I just didn't have that mm-hmm. I think set me up to, okay, I'm looking for that in other people. And so being 13, I'm, I'm going to find it. Right. Somewhere. Sure. <laughs> it's a necessity <laughs> yeah. for a young child. So they're going to find it one way or another. Right. Whether in the positive places or in the negative places. They're yeah. going to find that acceptance and the longing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, I, mine was in the negative mm-hmm. because the, the my perpetrator lived in a trailer not that far from me. Mm. Um, in order for me to get to where I wanted to walk around or, or explore or whatever, I would constantly pass his house. Mm-hmm. Um, so... 
when I started doing that as our on the regular in my seventh and eighth grade years, um, of course he would follow me, you know, and he had his dogs and and we would meet and we would talk and he really probably started off as maybe wanting to just oh well this is a kid who seems alone mm -hmm. so we'll see I don't know um, but I think that's definitely one of the things that um, perpetrators look for is that vulnerability right. um, and the 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 seeking out of mm -hmm. someone outside of the family mm -hmm. uh, the makes isolation. them an e easy prey in a sense yeah yeah, yeah. and that yeah. isolation too is mm -hmm. another factor so it all come mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. that that summer of 1986 mm. <laughs> yeah. and so he would you know walk with me talk with me we would talk about just the normal things mm -hmm. and this whole process um, for those people who aren't familiar is, is in the survivors community is called grooming mm -hmm. and I'm sure people have heard of that sure. but, you know perpetrators find young men women that they can befriend and get trust in and you know slowly little by little they you know are able to gain that particular trust until that first physical sexual activity mm -hmm. um, which could be a variety of things sure. um, so during that time I really was like wow I have someone who's older mm -hmm. he's interested in my life you know I sought to hang out with him mm -hmm. so I was going after that that relationship and he saw that and then took advantage of that he yeah. saw that the opportunity was right and he said okay I'm, this is gonna be the, the thing and there was a Saturday afternoon that it happened mm. where um, he fondled me and and we had intercourse and so that was that was the sexual act that mm. from that point really changed the course of my entire life yeah um, and so the first book is really a fictionalized story about that particular mm -hmm. summer mm -hmm. um, and going through that and through those experiences yeah and then just a little bit of the feelings afterwards the sure. second one and kind of explores more of the the feelings the the brokenness the the relationship issues the, yeah. again still the need to connect still having all those things that mm -hmm. were there before but now they're magnified it takes on kind of the aftermath yeah of, and of unfortunately now they're sexualized yeah so everything that isolation is now sexualized mm -hmm. and the the need to have a male figurehead mm -hmm. even though it's not something that I may want to do or other survivors may want to do but it's sexualized mm. and so people go different ways and mm -hmm. obviously we can get into what that means sure sure uh, but yeah now now what was your relationship like with your parents through all of this so they had no idea mm -hmm. until were they highly involved in your life no or, or, okay no. Um, and I can remember from a young age where you know sometimes you'd have to take home homework and get it signed mm -hmm. by your parents and they would go through your math and say okay you know have your parents go through this with you i went through it on my own and said here sign and then they would and then i'd take it back and so that they, was they didn't much, even bother to read through it themselves bother, and just no. <laughs> tell like, me what i gotta do you. and then you go and <laughs> yeah we trust that you know what you're doing because yeah. again school was was my priority mm -hmm. and, you know um so that was that was that they mm -hmm. were not involved a whole lot in my life and I don't think they ever figured anything was wrong right. um, with me seeing this guy, mm. going out there, spending time with him, and then all of a sudden it stops. And mm. I don't even know if they knew. Yeah, they never that, and it never registered that. Yeah. 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 Wow. I'm trying to not give away all of your book and your story. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want people to get your book and read your story and read, mm -hmm. read about that. Um, but the the aftermath of that, I mean, I mean, because you've talked about the, uh, the the things that lead up to this, um, the 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 personal situations in life, the family situations, the uh, just the the growing up as a young man and the needs that a young man has mm -hmm. for companionship, for leadership, not just uh, uh, any leadership, but specifically male leadership. It's a, it's a very important thing that that in our culture is missing in a lot of ways today. Let's jump ahead to this. I, I'm with your boys. You mm -hmm. know, how, how has that affected your parenting, your boys? Mm, that's a good question because <laughs> um, I have three boys that are two years apart. Mm -hmm. The very first time I realized how overprotective and, and protective I was, I was in a La Habra Target. My wife was grabbing something from an aisle. I was turned away from Jason, my oldest, just for a minute. I turned back to see a guy just go by him and rub his head. No, you know, nothing more. But that enraged me that 
someone could take that opportunity, as small as it was, to even touch my child. Even how if how old was, was he at this time? Oh, he was probably 14 months, 16 oh, okay. months. So, so a little not baby. Even, okay. Yeah, not walking. Yeah. So he was in the, you know, in the cart, um, but old enough to be able to sit up and, you, mm-hmm. you know, all of that. Mm-hmm. And he was a cute kid, and he was blonde, and we were in a, you know, a place where there's not a lot of blonde kids. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure it was like, oh, this is a cute kid, you know? Yeah. But something as innocent as that now in my mind is not, and will never mm-hmm. be innocent. Sure. So, yeah. um, so there was that, and then as they got older, I was there more as an observer when we were out in public places at mm. at soccer, at basketball, at football, at baseball, whatever sports they were involved with, mm-hmm. just an observer um, mm-hmm. to make sure that they were okay. Mm-hmm. And things went great. There was no issues, but there was always that little piece in me that was like, I just can't let let that happen to them. Right. Not on my watch. I'm not right. going to allow them to go through the same yeah. things I went and through. And not, not even when I'm not looking either. Not right. just on my, not my watch, but yeah. my yeah. watch is 24 seven. Sure, so. sure, sure. Um, but 13, when they hit, when my oldest hit 13, which was the age that I was sexually abused, that was a very tough time mm. and kind of a turning point too, because I realized at 13, I couldn't make adult, adult decisions and I was not responsible for the sexual abuse mm. that happened to me because of it in therapy. It was a lot of, okay, it's not your fault. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Okay. But at 13, when we self perceive that we're like, but I was 13. I, I should have known. Sure. Now I, was I was wise enough up. to yeah. know certain things. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. you're still <laughs> looking back at that saying, but I was 13. I knew this, mm-hmm. but that's not the case. Mm-hmm. When you see your child at 13, you're like, no, there is no possible way yeah. that I could have consented, wanted, asked for, you know, any of those kinds of things. Yeah. I was a victim 100%. Sure. So in that respect, it was helpful mm-hmm. to realize, okay, I, I, I can accept that. And then when my middle hit 13, it was more acceptance. And when Mm. my youngest hit 13, the same thing, just reinforcement of that. Yeah. Um, And so watching them grow up and realizing, you know, that was good. But it was also agonizing too. Mm. Okay, here they're at the age where I was and being more diligent and worrying more and and really um, internalizing that. Mm -hmm. Um, Because there isn't a lot of other parents who share that that same experience as I do. Mm-hmm. So it does become a lot more. Yeah. And I know we'll touch on spouses later. But sure. um, yeah, I talk to my wife about these things, but mm-hmm. still the the sympathetic ideas that are behind that are, are still mm-hmm. hard unless you have a parent who's in the same right. role. Absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. And it was, gosh, I'm going to forget the date, but my, <laughs> my three boys knew we sat down and had a discussion um, about my own sexual abuse with mm-hmm. them. And it was, it was nice because here they are, we're all at the dinner table and I'm telling them what happened, not the details. Mm-hmm. And it became this discussion about how our family has always been strong in Christ and mm-hmm. always really supported one another and been there for each other mm-hmm. and saw each other through tough times. Yeah. And so it was a totally different conversation that I was expecting <laughs> and thank the Lord that none of my kids said, Oh yeah, guess what? It happened to me on a mm. church thing or yeah, whatever. Yeah, you know, absolutely. None of that happened. Yeah. Um, so that was really mm. good. And so mm-hmm. my, my boys have been very supportive Although they've struggled a little bit, they're like, I can't read the book, Dad, because oh, sure. <laughs> cause that's you, and I just that's, see that you, and I'm like, that's tough. fine. You yeah. do not have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> that would be hard to read about your dad and yeah. the struggles that they went through in those areas. So. Yeah, and I, I'm fine yeah. with that. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. After after high school, um, I mean, did, did, did your perpetrator move away? How did you separate in that sense? So the first thing... <clears throat> that happened was that there was just this great deal of anger after the first incident. Mm. And I, I really just kind of wiped out that whole environment mm. and it was just at home or at school. Mm. That was it. That was the only two places. And so when I said, I got to get out there cause it just was itchy and I couldn't stay inside anymore. Sure. Um, there was one contact where I made sure I yelled at him and said, you know, I've got a girlfriend, all these lies about you right. know, all this stuff that I have nothing. I don't want nothing to do with you. Mm-hmm. And it was very clear. So that was pretty much it on that respect. Mm-hmm. And then, um, he did move away. He moved mm-hmm. to, um, 
way across country in New Jersey, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And so I really was never to see him again. Okay. However, he did come back, um, called me up and said, hey, do you want to just go hang out in the, the Badlands for a little bit? And I'm like, mm. How long after? I was 16 at that time. Okay, so a couple years later. Yeah. Okay. And, and at <clears throat> 16, I was in therapy mm -hmm. because depression and anxiety and suicidal thoughts were just constant mm -hmm. and I still had not yet found that person who was going to save my life you know, <laughs> right. and take me you know that male figure who was mm -hmm. just gonna correct everything and make it all right mm -hmm. so I'm like well I'm 16 I'm bigger nothing's gonna happen and that was not the case at all mm -hmm. it happened one more time um, and this was something where it was more it was still the same coercion mm -hmm. um, but again it was kind of an out of body experience where mm. I really did separate my whatever physical stuff was going on mm -hmm. and really just was not there, not present. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of survivors will talk about that when when there's multiple um, encounters, encounters yeah. or multiple abuses or someone living who mm. is an abuser with yeah. them, which yeah. is actually more of the case right. than mine. Mm -hmm. um, so there was that experience and then that was the last one. Mm -hmm. So, um, after, during high school, I just got progressively more unstable, probably mm -hmm. is a good way to, to describe <laughs> it. I would throw myself into school and mm -hmm. stress over school. And I'm like, I've got to get these good grades cause I got to get out of this town. Yeah. I'm sick of living in, you know, where everybody knows everybody else's business, all the small town stereotypes you mm. can think of. Did, did was, people in town know no, what had happened? No okay. idea. Yeah. Okay. But there's always this fear that you walk into a room and mm. it's the scarlet letter on you that it's like, oh, well, we know what you did. You right, know? right. Because how in the world would someone who didn't know me know that the, that I would be susceptible to that? Yeah. So again, sure. my prefrontal cortex logic, you know, is mm. not working really well. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking they're they're going to know. You right, know? right. Um, so I just continued to get depressed, continued to have some suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, started cutting. Mm -hmm. Also, um, because with with most males who undergo this, cutting isn't a huge thing, or at least it wasn't uh -huh. a huge thing. It was more that's more of a female attribute. They're mm -hmm. more likely to have explosive, violent eruptions where they're destroying mm -hmm. other things. So sure. that's their self harm. Kind of the testosterone yeah, outbreak, much in that sense. Yeah. much more than that, yeah. and then. Um, there's also the hypersexuality. So mm -hmm. men will go out and they will just sleep with every girl that they can mm -hmm. because they want to mask whatever homosexual things that mm -hmm. they feel are mm -hmm. upon them. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also the constant working out. There's a little bit of a body image issue mm -hmm. where, okay, I've got to look better. I've got to be bigger so no one else hurts me. Mm -hmm. And it may be, that's not what they're thinking, but mm -hmm. they end up doing like the really violent sports, not just football, because I mean, mm. football is violent, sure. but, but I mean, those extreme things like martial arts. Right. And, um, they want to hurt somebody. They want to hurt somebody <laughs> sure. and they don't mind getting hurt because right. that's the whole They can take the pain because it masks the, mm. the, the pain from their abuse. Yeah. yeah. And it, it, it puts it somewhere else. Mm. And, and mm. it is temporary relief. Mm -hmm. um, it is a coping mm. mechanism, but it's mm. not a good one. Right. So. <laughs> right. Now, now, do you know the statistics on, on male abuse versus female abuse? Or uh, in your they're uh, reportedly, I don't know as the female as much. Mm -hmm. I want to say females are one in four. Okay. For males, it's one in six. Okay. But those statistics are what, rep what are reported. Sure. So obviously there's going to be you know, it's, it's definitely less than one, one in six, probably yeah. more like one in two for females mm. and one in four for males. Wow. Um, but yeah, one in six mm -hmm. is, is a common phrase in the survivor mm -hmm. community okay. because that is a statistic that, that mm -hmm. of reported, um, cases. Wow. Amazing. And then, so you were able to get out of town. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So all my hard work, I ended up paid being off. a salutatorian of my class. Mm hmm um, got some good scholarships and every school I applied to was far, far away from Wyoming. <laughs> um, and so I chose Whittier College mm -hmm. uh, only because they gave me the most money. Okay. All right. Hey. <laughs> it's like, I've got to that pay works. for college myself. I'm going to make sure I, that's I a, get That's a good priority. There. Yeah. And all through this time, mm -hmm. I had no knowledge of Christ. Mm -hmm. I, I was not a believer, but I, I was definitely seeking in lots mm -hmm. of different areas. Mm -hmm. um, I remember we would, I, my mom signed me up for 
uh, vacation Bible school once. Mm-hmm. I think mostly just to get me out of the house. Right. You know, not for any real spiritual purpose. Sure. Give you somewhere to go. <laughs> yeah, somewhere to go and out of her hair for a while. There you go. So mm-hmm. um, there was that. So mm-hmm. it, and I occasionally went to church with some friends in high school who were believers and who had very strong, very conservative mm-hmm. um, beliefs. Um, one that, you know, no music in church. So that was a lot. Okay. Um, for <laughs> Almost me, a legalistic. Like, yeah, 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 much more so. Mm-hmm. Um, so odd for me, but I still went and I mm-hmm. went because I wanted to be with my friends. Sure. Um, and then at 16 also, I was like, I've got to find something because there's there was something inside of me that just was really seeking out, not just a male figure, but also God. Mm. Um, really just wanting to understand more of okay what is my life's purpose and yeah. why did all of this happen but how can i erase it right you know, can i go to god and it just all go away mm-hmm. that was it was a strong pull mm-hmm. um and so you know being studious and having not a whole lot to do during summers i researched a lot of different religions from hinduism and buddhism and islam and some of those were like nope not going to do that one not going to do that one um looking at some of the christian religions and or denominations and realizing mm-hmm. oh, i'm not going to do that one that one's too much but finding a greek orthodox church mm-hmm. in our town and realizing um that that might be fun, might be interesting. Be fun, <laughs> yeah. That's okay. I've never heard anybody put it that way. Yeah, especially Greek Orthodox, Orthodox. That Orthodox might be church. fun. <laughs> that might be fun. I thought I was unique in thinking the Orthodox were fun. <laughs> no, I, I really did. All right. <laughs> and so you know, I looked into that, and and we did have a little small parish mm-hmm. in our town with mm-hmm. very few um, Greek families. Mm-hmm. Uh, the priest actually would only come once a month to do a service uh, okay. from Casper, Wyoming, which is a three-hour drive away. Wow. So I started attending there my, my junior year of high school and mm-hmm. loved it. Mm-hmm. And just, I think the the biggest draw for me was that I could leave everything at the door yeah. and enter into the presence of Christ mm. in that particular church mm-hmm. because it was the icons, the sure. iconostasis, everything about it was not. You were, you were surrounded by remembrances, and 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 it was able to, uh, to use lack of a better word, to distract you from everything else. Yeah. yeah. And so you had visual stimulation, you mm-hmm. had uh, uh, um, auditory stimulation, exactly. you had smells uh-huh. and sights and sounds and everything else that would, yeah. uh, that would allow you to to leave your your problems at the door and then enter a whole new world, if you yeah. will. Yeah. And and that world really. <laughs> didn't include being sexually abused mm-hmm. and that's exactly what i was looking for mm-hmm. i got to erase every time i came through the door yeah um, that part of me and that was a huge draw sure. so almost immediately i decided i want to do this mm-hmm. i want to become greek orthodox so um because the, the priest only came every so often by the time i graduated there wasn't time enough to really go through the whole mm-hmm. process mm-hmm. um so when i got to whittier I figured there's got to be churches here. <laughs> You're in Southern California. Yeah, there's got to be something. <laughs> a whole so plethora. <laughs> one church I went to was a Serbian Orthodox church, I believe, mm. in Montebello. Mm-hmm. And they were closed. But then I kind of went through the phone book and found one in La Habra mm-hmm. that, again, was a, a parish. It was an actual church, but had a deacon that would be would be there. And so every Saturday we'd have a service, and then Sunday morning we'd have the liturgy. So mm. I started going there and then became... Um, chrismated in the Orthodox Church. Okay. So my chrismation name is Alexander. So one wow. more name. Oh, hey, there you list. go. Terry Alexander Esty Estes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Junior. <laughs> Junior. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Yeah. So, and and I really do believe I can pinpoint a time, not a, mm. not a, a, a moment, but like mm. a time frame mm-hmm. where I'm like, I really believe in the Bible. Mm-hmm. You know, I was, it was right before becoming, um, finding this, the Orthodox church. I'm like, you know what? I've heard of all these things that the Bible says. And, and I was, I was, um, taken to a, a church of Christ center in LA uh-huh. and that turned me off, but I'm like, I'm going to really figure out what this says. Mm-hmm. So I got a Bible, got involved in the Christian fellowship group, mainly mm-hmm. because of my wife. Mm-hmm. Um, she and wasn't then, your wife at the time. I'm not at the time. Okay. No, no, yeah. Just a, a girl I was interested yes. in. <laughs> and then really just started with Genesis and going through it. I'm like, Oh, I remember some of these things from vacation Bible school mm-hmm. and, you know, then got into the church. And so over that short time frame, I really realized and I can remember a passage that I had written in a journal 
um, talking about the Church of Christ, if that's what it means to be a Christian, I am not going to do it mm. because I want to follow what the Bible really says. Mm. You know, so there was this sense of it's the answer's got to be here. Yeah, and that didn't come from the Christian Fellowship Group. It didn't come from you know anybody telling me that mm-hmm. but it really was one of those spiritual interventions that said this is where you're going to find your answer yeah and again i know lots of people become christians in a moment but mm-hmm. i i do feel like that was part of it but there was this development that happened over months of there's more of a process for yeah, you in that sense definitely yeah. because then there was the understanding of the old testament and mm-hmm. then realizing gosh numbers is awful <laughs> am i ever gonna get through this how do i read through this book <laughs> yeah and uh sorry jews <laughs> but, <laughs> i think many of them struggle with that too. yeah i'm sure they do but then getting to the new testament and yeah. seeing you know and hearing about that and then being involved in our christian fellowship mm. that we had and mm-hmm. going to prayer groups and really uh, being observant and watching and what other guys were doing mm. and then they kind of became not the mentors I was thinking of, but sure. mentors in a way sure. that that really helped me realize what a Christian life involves. Mm. What mm-hmm. what are some foundations that you can have, and then building upon those foundations. Yeah. So, and what what were some of the struggles that you found? I mean, because moving away, I think I would imagine that you you felt that you were getting away from your past. Mm-hmm. That that if I could move somewhere else and start over again, then I could, you know, just erase the past create a new life and move forward from that yeah that's always good in theory but i find it never really happens Mm -hmm. um because you're always bringing part of you with you wherever you go sure and so trying to bury those things that are good or bad Mm -hmm. just are not going to work because they're going to surface yeah and so i think my freshman year the biggest thing was wow there's this los angeles out there Mm-hmm. that I can go and explore mm-hmm. and find stuff. And so I was good at that. I, I mean, from a small town, that was probably amazing that you've yeah, got this big city now to, it was. to, to live in and explore. And then, and then really find things. And yeah. I, I got a job working with um, uh, developmentally disabled um, students. Mm-hmm. And so I would go to their house. I would play with them, watch them, whatever was required. And that got me to know East San Gabriel Valley, mm-hmm. um, you know, Pasadena area, tons of different places. Yeah. And so I found places again to explore and mm-hmm. find myself and find other things. And mm-hmm. so I knew this area even better than my wife, who grew up here. Um, you <laughs> You're know. seeing areas that she's never seen before. Yeah. Probably. Or being yeah. able to say, oh, you just go down the 57 and it cuts into the, it makes the, the 210. And right. she's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> you're going to have to draw here. me a map. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was no GPS at that time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, yeah. only the Thomas guides. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Dating ourselves now. Yep. <laughs> so, so what were some of the challenges that you found when you thought you were going to leave it all behind and, and forming relationships in college? Because you're in a new place where you mm-hmm. didn't know anybody. You had to form all new relationships. Uh, you got to create your own identity. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and what were some of the, what, what was that like? What were some of the, the challenges and the victories that you found in that? Um, <clears throat> I think one of the biggest challenges was that I had a whole bunch of background knowledge that was very different than the background knowledge of people that grew up here. Mm. And so trying to relate to some of those things was difficult and then vice versa. Right. Um, My, let's see, my sophomore year roommate grew up here had no idea what an ice scraper was when I when he pulled it out of my car he's like what is this uh, I know, thought it was a weapon or yeah something. <laughs> something as simple as this and then when mm-hmm. I told him what it was before he couldn't believe that it actually happened that you could get ice on your windshield <laughs> you know so those kinds of things and being able to balance okay here's my life in California but mm-hmm. I still have my parents and my brothers and some mm-hmm. friends back in Wyoming mm-hmm. you know going back and forth just never seemed to really kind of fit either at that point okay i didn't fit in in wyoming anymore right because i was i lived in california now even if it had only been a week yeah and i still hadn't figured out everything in california yet mm. and so not having some of that background knowledge too again 
was, well, how do I socialize? What do I right. do? What What's acceptable? What's not acceptable? Because mm-hmm. um, normally in, in my town, if we were to spend a Friday night, we'd drive up and down Main Street and mm-hmm. talk and listen to music. Well, you don't do that here in, in California. Um, <laughs> not as much, no. Not as, no. <laughs> so those were some adjustments. Yeah. And I think the bi- the biggest one in the relationship is that I still carried that I want to find someone who can meet those best best friendship needs that mm-hmm. I never was able to have mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and so it was a, that constant search okay could this person be a good friend mm-hmm. could this person be a good friend and then then once it finally came out that yeah I'd been abused I've been mm-hmm. sexually abused who can I trust sure. to with this information yeah. who can I trust mm-hmm. that that they're going to understand me and still accept me right um, so there was a lot of trial by error thinking okay here's the person that might be that really really good friend Mm -hmm. that i can totally trust in and and be okay and grow myself Mm -hmm. with that person but then realize that's an expectation that's pretty big because i'm carrying 18 19 20 years of lifetime of expectations Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. hoping that that's going to happen in two or three months right so that it and you know by the time it's the end of the college year then Mm -hmm. that's more well established right so there was mm. very unrealistic realistic expectations I put on people in college mm-hmm. throughout, mm. whether I was a freshman or a senior. Mm-hmm. So, well, I, you know, I, I can imagine that too. That, that everybody in college is working through their personal issues mm-hmm. as well. You know, the you've got a whole bunch of people becoming their own people, mm-hmm. and, and you know, working through their own childhood issues uh, to varying extents and degrees, and, and some more challenging than others, and so on. But you know, to, to look for an individual that's going to meet that need and then to constantly be fearful of exposing yourself uh, and, and, and putting making yourself vulnerable to them for them to hurt you, mm-hmm. uh, that's got to be a challenge to build healthy relationships at all. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it really and, is. And then the fear of being rejected, the fear of being uh, left, um, left. Is more so than anything mm. else is that... Okay. Um, I found that in in our Christian community at, at Whittier, people were very accepting. Mm-hmm. You know, when I came out and said, "This is what happened to me," people surrounded me, and it was mm-hmm. really good. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, what what I feared most is, okay, they're going to see all of that stuff, all that brokenness, all of those issues that I have, and they're going to be like, "Whoa, this is way too much. I can't deal mm-hmm. with it. I'm out." Yeah, and that's even more probably more hurtful than an initial. You know what? I hear your story, but I just can't can't do that. Right? You know, don't even, let's not even start a, any kind of friendship or relationship because <laughs> like, okay. you're not attached to that person. Now. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's the moment no... you start forming any attachment, then yeah. then that's where the separation hurts more. And I think for myself, and maybe this is for a lot of other people, there's a codependency mm-hmm. um, factor mm-hmm. with other people that oh god, I gotta form these relationships, and I gotta form them fast, and I gotta form them solid, and I gotta do all this because mm-hmm. I've only got this much time to be yeah. able to do this because there's there's just a time limit and there's this anxiety mm. and yeah. and that doesn't form good friendships or relationships sure, sure. at all <laughs> yeah yeah i know in, in your book you were, you were talking you know a lot about that the, the desire to fit in mm-hmm. and, and you found yours in the classroom yeah uh and, and um your your intellectual pursuits uh and your your hard work in those avenues gave you um respect mm-hmm. and, and value in the eyes of others Maybe that's what what you were seeking a lot was to be validated uh, as a person mm-hmm. and, and as as someone who contributes and has something valuable for others. Yeah. And and did did college change that in you at all? Were were you still seeking that in college, or was it kind of you you know that was a high school thing and then you moved on to different aspects of relationships as you got into college? I think mm-hmm. that there's there's a continuum of what you're saying that Mm. in high school yeah it was really important to be work hard and get straight a's and do all of those things and get scholarships and win contests and Mm -hmm. all of that Mm -hmm. um because that's where i could at least find some normalcy yeah and say okay okay i can do this Mm -hmm. you know i maybe can't throw a football but i can do this i Mm -hmm. can write an essay Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. that didn't necessarily change in college having that background was now, premarital uh, intimacy, um, not not necessarily sexual intimacy, but mm-hmm. being, you know, personally intimate, giving your heart to another person in that way, was that difficult to do? Very difficult yeah. to do because even though I was a new person in Christ at that moment, mm. 
my behavior patterns hadn't really changed much. My mm. instinctual behavior patterns of everything is now sexualized doesn't change much. Right. So to be intimate meant to have sex. Sure. That, there was no in between mm -hmm. for that. It wasn't the emotional connection or the the personal connection that you have with the person. It right. was a physical connection that, yeah. that, that, that spoke intimacy to you. Right. And so yeah. if we were going to do what Christian couples normally do and not and refrain from sex until marriage, that means most every intimate part of that mm. relationship also has to stop too. Mm -hmm. and that was very difficult for my wife mm -hmm. at the time when she wasn't my wife because that was, you know, for her to find value um, in a relationship is me praising her and, and encouraging her mm -hmm. and, you know, really giving my heart to her in intimate, non-sexual ways. Yeah. I just had no idea. <laughs> How do you that do was. that? <laughs> there was, that wasn't yeah. even on my radar. That wasn't even, that was one of those things you don't even know you mm. are supposed to know yeah it's like yeah oh well we just go and we date and we get married and then we have sex and then right. everything else falls into place right right well, so every young man is trying to navigate that for themselves <laughs> too and then you throw in the the background of, of abuse and, and that just makes it that much more complicated and yeah difficult. and it was and, very complicated because yeah. it was very black and white yeah that no not at all until we get married yeah so what are some of the lasting effects of sexual abuse on a survivor I well for myself I don't well I should never say never <laughs> but I don't know if I'll ever really be able to express emotions as they come one of the hardest things that I've ever had is that I have been able to in my you know my before Christian life my my now Christian life whatever emotions I have I can shut down really really fast mm. And I've become so good at it, I don't even do it consciously anymore. It just happens. Um, mm. Both my parents have passed. Um, neither one of them has been you know, a great role model. But I did not cry for mm -hmm. either of them. I've had a lot of experiences where, okay, I, I, something bad happens, I feel the emotion, and then I can feel my body just kind of close it down, uh -huh. shut it down. Mm -hmm. And so I know that's definitely one of those, of those lasting effects is... Just the, that ability to express emotion and tied into that is that ability to then share a relationship with um, other people. Um, I lead a survivor, male survivors group on Saturdays and I am the only one that is married currently. Mm. There is one man that, that is divorced but the other men are right now all single and I think a lot of those relationship issues and trust issues are really very difficult because mm -hmm. to expose yourself that you know that vulnerability that and in their their perspective the the stain on your masculinity mm -hmm. that that proves is really difficult to, mm -hmm. to overcome mm -hmm. um they're the men are very spiritual but they're not necessarily believers all of them um, mm -hmm. so you know there there's that in christ that does really help that yeah i can feel like i'm not really a man a lot of the times but I know that I can go ahead and find out my identity and just even say, okay, my identity is in Christ. If that's as far as I get, that's as far as I get that day. Mm -hmm. um, but for those that don't have that, it can be very difficult. So sure. building intimate and long lasting relationships is, is really difficult. Yeah. And do you think that comes from pushing down those emotions all those years before they come up and it just becomes the habit of not wanting to feel the emotions mm -hmm. in my experience yeah mm -hmm. definitely i can say for me that is 100 percent the case yeah um mm -hmm. i think maybe for others it might be you know just that ability to connect completely with someone else mm -hmm. um, be vulnerable be vulnerable mm -hmm. be emotionally intimate not mm -hmm. sexually intimate because you go back to that again and and there really is either no sex or sex and that's all a lot of survivors have mm -hmm. yeah you know, if there's not a relationship um, going on, then you don't have one. Or if there is, then it's going to involve sex. Okay. So there's no in between. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that and that can be difficult for a lot of people to to understand. Yeah, and to build your relationship on a sexual platform mm -hmm. is not a healthy relationship in the first place. Right. But then to bring the abusive past into that, yeah, it uh, makes for an extra unhealthy relationship, exactly. I guess you could say. Exactly. Yeah. And then you know, we're, I know we're kind of bleeding into some other things, but that is one thing that people who are not survivors could really understand is that 
the whole basis for everything in their lives, especially the younger that they've been sexually abused, mm -hmm. it all has to do with the sexual relationship. Mm -hmm. So a friendship has some something to do with a sexual relationship. Mm -hmm. An actual physical relationship is going to have something to do with sex, mm -hmm. whether it's the aversion mm -hmm. to that or it's the embracing of mm -hmm. that. Interesting. Now, you, you've written these two books, One More Broken and One Less Bruised. Now, now these are... I don't know how loosely based on your personal story. Ah, okay. So the first one <laughs> is, I don't even know if I could quantify it, but there are some things that are true, a lot of things that are not. Mm -hmm. Where things are true, I think I even exaggerated mm -hmm. and try to incorporate more survivors and, okay, this is what a typical survivor would experience. Okay. So you're trying to tell the general story of, a, yeah. of an abuse survivor. Yeah. And then, the the mm. whole premise though the the sequence of events mm -hmm. is really my story okay but some of the actual nitty-gritty of the stuff is exaggeration yeah or you know yeah. or fictionalized because it comes from other people's mm. stories and experiences mm -hmm. the second book is much much more fictionalized but much and that's the one less bruise one less bruise mm -hmm. trying to get that whole picture of all survivors and having each survivor relate in some way okay. to that particular story. Mm -hmm. They're so connected, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's sequels, they go together. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the One Less Bruise is a lot less of my own life. Okay. Now, now, who did you have in mind when you were writing these books? Who were you writing for? Um, well, the survivor primarily, mm -hmm. um, because in my experience, most survivors do not talk about their experience. Sure. Or they're in this situation where they don't realize that what has happened to them is actually abuse, mm. is actually sexual abuse, rape, because it's a family member or it's been going on for so long that, well, that was just something that happened in my family. Don't all families do that? You know, uh, and so hmm. there, there's not that recognition that, no, that's, that's not really what happens in the majority mm -hmm. of families. Mm -hmm. So it's about survivors trying to talk about their experiences, um, have a common understanding among themselves that, oh, this went on with you, oh, this went on with me. I feel a lot more normal right. than I did before because I have a shared common So, so it's, it's taking the issue of sexual abuse out of the closet, if you will, out of, yeah. this, out of the shadows, shining a light on it and saying, this is a real part of people's lives, not just your life, mm -hmm. but there are other people that share this experience. You're a part of this community. You're a part of, of something that does happen. Yeah. And so don't don't feel shamed by it. Don't be hindered by it, but find hope, find healing. You know. Yeah. Be able to move on from it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they're they're you know, the tie to me me, the character finding <laughs> um, the the church mm -hmm. is important too because mm -hmm. that is a big stepping stone for mm -hmm. the character and me in finding, okay, there is that hope, there is that healing. Mm -hmm. And there is that person out there who is the person that can save you. It's just not who you think it is. Right. <laughs> it's not a physical guy you're going to sit down with. It's not a physical guy you're going to yeah. sit down with. Yeah. But yeah. it is the Christ. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. then the, and then also for people that have not had that experience to be able to look at it and say, oh my gosh, I never knew this kind, these kinds of things mm -hmm. went on. Now I'm aware about it. Now I can watch out for my neighbor's kid, my, mm -hmm. you know, kids in my classroom, the, you know, the kids in my extended family, whatever mm -hmm. that is and mm -hmm. say, Oh, maybe I recognize some of these things. Maybe I should pay more attention to what's going on. One other <coughs> aspect too, that I've kind of found mm -hmm. within this is in my group, there's a mixture of homosexuals, heterosexuals, LGBT. And I'm finding that in that experience, there's a lot of people that are part of that community that don't understand what happened to them was wrong mm. because they associate their same sex attraction and now their lifestyle to, Oh, well I was always this way because I always look to men or I always look to women mm. because I was attracted to them. Mm -hmm. So it's another Avenue to say to the community, that's not a normal experience. Whatever you're experiencing now is very separate right. from what happened to you as a child. Yeah. Please recognize that what happened to you as a child was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I'm going to end that one. That's, a, then that's an important, another... <laughs> yeah, that's an important distinction to make because, you know, a lot of people tie in and, and a lot of psychological theories and stuff tie in your childhood experiences 
to your adult identity. Mm -hmm. And they link them together in such a way that you are formed by your childhood identities. Mm -hmm. They explain away your behavior. Yeah. And so it takes, it really takes the, uh, uh, the responsibility away from an adult uh, making their own choices mm -hmm. and, and being their own person yeah. by simply saying, well, because of this, you have no choice but to be this today. Mm -hmm. And so be it, be it sexual issues, be it uh, uh, you know, other just family abuse issues or, or, or verbal issues or whatever it might be, you know, it's it's that uh, that mindset that we are formed by these things, mm -hmm. rather than you know choosing in some ways. Now, those things certainly play an effect in our life and right. and, and make it difficult, you know, not to demean or 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 or, or, or minimize any of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, we all have the choice to to uh, move forward and mm -hmm. heal from those things and and realize that we are the victim and not the we're not defined by those things. Yeah, I and think that's, that's important. That's important for me to to get across, and mm -hmm. that's important. I think for even people who haven't experienced that mm -hmm. is that you know you can look at someone who may be in that LGBTQ um, group, mm -hmm. and if they say, you know, they may not recognize that they were abused, but we can help them realize that yeah, you were, mm -hmm. and that was not your fault, and and there's healing that's found just in that. Yeah. So yeah. And yeah. that's kind of where I end. And right. I let other people who are experts <laughs> take over from there. Yeah, there's a, that's a whole other arena to get into now, the, yeah. the current lifestyle choices that yeah. people make and, yeah. and that. But yeah, to not overtie them to our childhood and not mm -hmm. uh, not make ourselves surrendered you know, to victims of circumstance in our current situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that there is hope and healing from the past, regardless of what we want to do with our future. Yeah. <laughs> That's an important step. So l let's let's talk a little bit about those that surround abuse mm -hmm. sur survivors, because this is, I think, a, a lot of people in the church, a lot of uh, people, you know, in, our, in just our society, we may not realize, first of all, that, that there are abuse survivors around us because a lot of abuse survivors, like you said, don't tell their story. Yeah. You don't wear it on your sleeve. There's no badge <laughs> that, that you go about and, and you're not pronouncing that to the world. So are there, are there things that, that just the general population that we in general could be mindful of? Uh, in and just going about our, our just our day, mm -hmm. and I know this is a very generic <laughs> you know term that that you know we can, don't, nobody wants to walk on eggshells or, yeah. or be that sensitive to everything. But are are there things that you've seen uh, or experienced that that you know was just complete uh, ignorance or um, you know, on somebody's part regarding these issues that, that could have been greatly avoided. <laughs> yeah. And for the most part, my experience with telling others has been positive. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's because God has just blessed me because of those interactions or, you know, people tend to be just very accepting at initially that, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, that's your story. I mean, that's pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Or if it's just luck, you know, mm -hmm. I just found the right people to tell. Right. Um, but I think that, that, survivors again going back to that they want to feel normal like they're not some plague or they're not they, they don't have just one eye but, right but they're just normal people who bad things have happened to mm -hmm. which everybody can associate that with mm -hmm. and so really just being able to fit in and not feel like we're awkward crazy is good mm -hmm. and so even my my me categorizing myself it almost isolates our group into some right but I know with survivor and survivor issues, that's the biggest thing is just to be and treat as you normally would mm -hmm. someone. And that also includes, you know, if like you just don't like someone who happens to tell you this story about being abused, you don't have to be their friend, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. just because they had something really sad happen to them. Sure. You know, you have sure. that permissibility to say no to a friendship, mm -hmm. to a relationship. And, and I think you'd said earlier, maybe we were speaking before this, that, you know, it, it's almost better to be honest up front in that sense mm -hmm. that, you know, because before that person starts to emotionally give themselves to you in a way or form that bond of friendship and, and that connection with you, that can be more damaging yeah. after the fact to come out and say, you know, I never really liked you at all. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you telling me these things rather than up front saying, you know what, I'd really not interested in going down that road with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. That honesty up front can be very important. Very important. So, <laughs> Honesty, definitely. But, you know, just mm -hmm. treating others as, as you kind of want to be treated, too. Mm -hmm. um, 
one of the things that I had trouble with growing up was boundary setting mm. because I always felt like either I went way too far and expected someone else in, a, in someone else's life to be all of these things mm -hmm. or I went the opposite way and I shut everybody out or there was the back and forth. Okay, yeah. now I do this. Nope, now I'm going to shut myself off. Trying to find the happy medium. <laughs> yeah, and, and, yeah, and always going to extremes. Sure. And so mm -hmm. I think with survivors really um, realizing that they do have trouble with boundaries, mm -hmm. that they may say, do things that just seem out of the ordinary, mm -hmm. uh, but still doing that in a loving way and said, hey, here's, here's a good boundary for us to set. Here's a good expectation mm -hmm. that I can help that I can meet with you in a friendship, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you might want to text me 75 times a day and then call me at the end of the day to see how I'm doing. But let's do this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that, that never would, would happen. Me, totally. I'd be like, oh, I got a new friend, you know? Yeah. And call And you smother them. And smother them. Yeah. And, and so, you know, just saying, hey, let's let's set a time and we'll meet this weekend and we'll, we'll do these things and, and, mm -hmm. you know, just setting those boundaries can be really mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Uh, and I think that a lot, a lot of times for a survivor, it's an all or nothing kind of thing. Yeah, it is Okay. very much. So yeah, yeah it's like, okay, you're either going to be my friend and be the best friend I've ever had, mm -hmm. or we're going to be enemies and I'm never going <laughs> to, or I'm never going to see you. So, right. Yeah. Finding that medium mm -hmm. is really important. And mm -hmm. I think that's why mm -hmm. sometimes people might get turned off mm -hmm. by, hearing someone's story because now it's like are they going to be dependent upon me mm -hmm. for everything because they've been abused and they've told me this and they've entrusted me in this and yeah. that's not necessarily the case sure sure but, but definitely helping to set those boundaries are, are really good yeah and i found that that happens more with younger mm. survivors not so much older survivors older survivors tend to be a lot more cynical Mm. So you almost have to kind of win their trust and, <laughs> and maybe be more of a friend to them right. because they're going to, they've been burned so many times that it's more difficult to reach them. Sure. They've almost given up on forming and looking for that person. Yeah. 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 What else um, surrounding a survivor, be it a friend or a spouse, or maybe even specifically looking at a spouse, what are things that they can do mm -hmm. um, to help, to be more empathetic? to be more uh, understanding, to uh, help the healing process? What are some steps that are genuinely beneficial for the person rather than a, a, a friend or a spouse trying to put in their own two cents? Yeah, that's huge because mm -hmm. I, at least for me personally, being independent was really important because mm -hmm. that really showed, oh yeah, I can do this. and. Not that I don't need people, but if I can do it on my own, mm -hmm. that helps validate my own personal experience. Mm -hmm. So putting your two cents in isn't always necessarily the best thing to do. Yeah. Um, so allowing a person to make mistakes, but being there for them when they happen mm -hmm. and, you know, really validating, hey, you tried, you did this, you, you went, you know, you did something that you didn't normally do. Those can be very helpful. Just that kind of just the encouragement, encouragement and celebrating sure. every little victory, almost yeah. and pointing out the positive, right? Yeah, and then you know recognizing that okay, there was some negative in there too. Yeah, this really sucked, mm -hmm. and I'm sorry that sucked. Mm -hmm. um, what can I do to help you make it better? Mm -hmm. You know, kind of almost always putting it back onto that person to yeah. to help them live that life better. You kind of have to go through some of the stages of relationships with people to figure out do they want me to solve do they want me mm. to just listen is it a combination of those things and mm -hmm. that just takes time yeah you know so getting to know that person and, and deciding if i'm going to invest time into that person sure. is a good thing too it takes a lot of patience to get to that point in yeah. that relationship to learn about the other person so learning about in any relationship you've got to learn about the other person mm -hmm. here you've got a, a person with this dimension of their life mm -hmm. and uh, you're mm -hmm. gonna have to learn how to navigate that yeah yeah so a lot of just being a good friend yeah. is really what survivors need. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Sometimes a little bit more, but again, as you, as a person develops that relationship with them, they'll kind of discover that. I think that's one of the, the challenges of people that have friendships, have relationships with the survivor. They want to help, but I think oftentimes don't know how. Yeah. And so, uh, so, <clears throat> so boundary setting, being a good listener, being... Uh, patient, uh, being encouraging, not pointing it out, not not kid gloving it in that yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. One of the most valuable things that that really helped me is I have a uh, a friend from uh, the old church we used to go to, and he's really super handy. He drives a motorcycle. You know, everything is just you know he just exudes macho. <laughs> 
best kind of af- affirmation I got from him is that he helped me to fix a toilet hmm. and was patient. He showed me how to do it mm-hmm. and then he let me do it. And then I did it and I felt great about myself. Sure. And that, you know, those kinds of things can be really helpful. So yeah. a lot of survivors, they may be really handy. They may not, but they're going to be deficient in something. Mm-hmm. And if they can, you know, help them out in some way where you really validate what they do through that, that, that can be really helpful yeah. too. Yeah. So. You're, you're investing in them in a sense yeah. and, and you know, giving them that new skill, that new sense of accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Whatever area it may be. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Now, now as a church, this is a topic that churches don't address very often. We've seen it come up in the news. Mm-hmm. It, w- when we do hear about it, it it's always an after effect kind yeah. of a thing. <clears throat> There's perhaps precautions that need to be put in place. And mm-hmm. Not perhaps, but yes. <laughs> um, there are many churches out there with those in place, which are very good. But it's obviously been an issue because you have trusted figures mm-hmm. that win over uh, young men, young women, and then they take advantage of that role and that position. And so um, as the church... What can the congregations do? I mean, because obviously coming together, um, maybe it fits into what we've been talking about here, just the, the, the belonging, you know. Mm-hmm. Are, are there things that, that you've seen or that you can think of that in the church setting, the church as a whole can do better with yeah. in these issues? The biggest thing mm-hmm. is that <clears throat> to understand you can't necessarily invite a survivor right into church because they're going to be very untrusting to begin with. Mm-hmm. And again, it's from that same reason that you said they're they're coming from a background where maybe they were abused because of a church member. So mm-hmm. they are that's the last thing that they're going to want to do. Sure. However, investing in a relationship one on one is a great way to get that started. Mm-hmm. So that's really not any different than any ministry in in a sense is starting with that you know personal relationship and really not talking so much about God and what God can do for them yet, mm-hmm. but really just getting them to talk about their experience mm-hmm. and making them feel normal and making them feel like, okay, you're not a victim, mm-hmm. but what happened to you was was wrong, was, you know, reprehensible, all of that. And now let's move forward and then start introducing Christ. Yeah. And how, you know, and again, mm-hmm. I think through mm-hmm. personal experiences work the best mm-hmm. where it's like, this is how Christ has affected me. This is what Christ has done for me. And leave it at that. Yeah. Let them come up with their own conclusions sure. based upon those things. Yeah, it's like, like I said, it's like a lot of these ministries that <clears throat> you have to have the relationship to really introduce Christ to them, mm-hmm. regardless of their background. That, that, you know, we always have that saying that they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. <laughs> and so for, for anybody, and, and perhaps even more a, a abuse survivor, they need to feel a part of things. They need to know you're genuinely looking for their interests and you're genuinely... Uh, uh, compassionate and interested in their good in their life mm-hmm. before they're going to open themselves up in a way. Oh yeah, because uh, yeah. there's a guard that's already set in place for them. So yeah, exactly. Uh, you're, you're not winning their trust for your own benefit, but you, in a sense, you do have to win their trust mm-hmm. and and show them that you are genuinely concerned for their well-being and and, and are interested in them as people. Yeah, and yeah. that's really big because mm-hmm. yeah. um, sometimes we don't necessarily feel like people. Mm. We feel like Statistics. A statistic. We feel like a victim. We mm. feel like someone else's thing. Less than human. That they use yeah. for whatever they need. Yeah. So that is definitely one thing. Mm. I think the church as a whole should not be afraid to talk about sexual issues. Obviously, appropriately to the different age levels. Sure. Um, but one of the biggest things that I've noticed is that the stranger danger is really not the issue. <laughs> <laughs> It's the people in your own family. Yeah. Um, in our group, except for maybe two, mm. they've all been abused by a family member. Mm. And so that should hopefully become a bigger issue for the church is mm-hmm. how can we ensure that children are safe in their own home? Right. And I'm certainly not advocating, you know, go telling your, you know, <laughs> sure people, but... But I think by opening those conversations up and mm-hmm. talking about the issue more and not being afraid of, you know, talking about sex, because mm-hmm. you don't have to talk about sex to talk about sexual abuse, because mm-hmm. there's a whole bunch of other stuff that surrounds that. Mm-hmm. And so churches really can 
open up the floor to talk about grooming relationships, to talk about other kinds of abuse that mm -hmm. are that can be involved in sexual abuse, yeah. can talk about pornography mm -hmm. and the impact that that has on men and women now growing sure. in number. Sure. So there's all of those kinds of issues that that are central mm -hmm. to childhood sexual abuse that yeah. can be talked about too. And the kids are being taught that in the public schools mm -hmm. and they're being taught it from a very different worldview and perspective yeah. and, and encouraged in different ways mm -hmm. <laughs> than they would be in a church setting. So yeah. the, the, the approach to the subject is going to be very different mm -hmm. based on where they're getting it from. Yeah. And so for those that are allowing the public schools to be the sole source of information, they're going to get a very different uh, view on sexuality and what is appropriate, what is biblical, what's right, mm -hmm. what's acceptable. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think you can, you know, for, for students that are in the public school setting, mm -hmm. when it comes to sexual abuse, I think we can feel safe enough to mm -hmm. say, okay, you know, they're going to say something certain things are wrong and we need to look out for this and we need to talk to people if these things happen. Mm -hmm. But I think it kind of stops there and it's like, well, then what can the church do to help heal that? Right. Okay. Right. So once that is out, what are the steps that they can take, mm. the church can take to help those who have been hurt yeah. and are struggling and have all these strings of issues? So that's where mm. the church can really step in too. Yeah. So I kind of see it as how can we prevent it and really by focusing on families mm. and, you know, family roles and strengths and, you know, experiences and connection and community. And then how can we help when after it happens, recognizing mm. that it does, mm -hmm. um, not being afraid to talk about the sexual issues, not necessarily sex itself, mm -hmm. but, but all of those things that surround it. Yeah. Well, let's end with some personal experience on your part about how you found healing. <laughs> what are what are how some I of the still how you are still? I'm sure it's an ongoing <laughs> it, process. But is but what, what is it that, that that was the big turning point for you? And what you know, you talked about going to church and finding that escape and, and finding the one that you know met those needs that you were looking for. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and, and uh, you know how how you found the measure of healing that you have found? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, the biggest thing is is to find an outlet for those emotions, and I think that's where the books came in. I don't think I would be as far as I am without having that outlet of expression of just writing it down and mm. saying, okay, well, this may not be true, but I know it's an experience and I know it's a feeling. I'm going to write about it. So that has been a good outlet for so me. Being able to express yourself to someone in some way. Yeah, mm -hmm. even if it's to pen and paper sure. or computer. Artistically you know? or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah, so finding some outlet to do that. Mm -hmm. um, if a person is alone and a survivor, they really need to find someone in the community that is a, is a survivor too mm -hmm. because there's nothing like being able to feel more normal and fit in mm -hmm. than sharing an experience and then having a person say, I would do the same thing, yeah. I understand what you're saying. Or even stopping and saying, I know exactly what you've just been through. Mm -hmm. You know, because there's a lot of people in our group that that talk about things and we can shorten what we say because we already know this everybody right. else has been. You don't have it. to rehash it and relive yeah. it at this time. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so finding that mm -hmm. that in community can be helpful. Mm -hmm. And then just therapy too, just mm -hmm. you know, being able to talk things out, being mm -hmm. with someone that you really trust. Mm -hmm. Um, has been really good mm -hmm. in just helping me figure out stuff. And um, for me, what has worked the best is to have a person always engage me in inquiry. Like, okay, so what does that mean? What does that feel? Mm. And what does that do? And mm. always having me kind of circulate my emotions and yeah. work them out myself yeah. to, to help. Learn how to feel your emotions. Yeah, yeah. and I'm still <laughs> working on that. Of course. I think for survivors... Uh, I just pray that they don't feel alone because mm -hmm. they're not. Mm -hmm. um, and then for those of people listening that are not survivors, um, just be listening and watching. Mm -hmm. It's the best thing you can do. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Well, I know on your website, it, it's your website is Harry Estes. Harry L. Estes. Harry L. Estes. Yeah, it's it's kind of hard to see the L. Since it is. It's <laughs> .com, yeah. Harry L. Estes .com. We'll have a link to it on our website cool. as well. So people can go there and read about your story, see your books, order your books there. We'll also have links to Amazon where they can order your books. Um, but I know you've got uh, some links to some agencies and organizations yeah. that provide help and offer. Mm -hmm. Are those you want to mention those real quick for uh, anybody yeah. that's looking? A good resource that I found is MailSurvivor.com. Mm -hmm. um, they, it's 
it's kind of formatted in lots of different ways where there's resources and information and then there's a whole community where there's different message boards and chat rooms where men can talk about a variety of issues. Mm. Um, as far as being spiritual, there's not a whole lot there, but you can find people <laughs> there who, because of their situation, have found Christ too. So mm -hmm. you just got to be searching for it. Yeah. But um, so that's one that I definitely recommend okay. uh, going in for. So. And, and in their churches, obviously going to their pastoral staff yeah, or you know, trusted seek, trusted elders or, or yeah, uh, seek those people out mm -hmm. and you know don't be afraid to take the time mm -hmm. to seek out the right person. Absolutely. And we'll put, again, all the links on our website so you'll have access to all of that. And if you are a survivor who is working through the healing, we do, again, encourage you to, to connect up with somebody. Send us a note and we will help you find someone. Go to harrylestis.com and connect with Esty. Yeah. And he will connect with you personally or yeah, find someone I, to help you connect. And Yeah, on my website I do have a, a place where you can um, message me and I have a blog that I try to keep up fairly mm -hmm. regularly. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's lots of different ways. Yeah. To... So just know you're not alone if you are yeah. uh, struggling through that and there is hope, there is healing, there is a future, there is a healthy life to have and, and lots of blessing to come from that and, mm -hmm. and lots of people that uh, would be interested and willing to surround you with friendships that are healthy and love that is appropriate. So yeah. uh, definitely reach out, make, take that step. And I know that's the hardest thing to do, first of all. Is it to, is extremely difficult, <laughs> yes. The, the, the first can expression done. can be the biggest yeah. uh, hurdle. So once you overcome that, mm -hmm. can definitely do that. So, and I'm working on book number three, just so you know. So excellent. I look forward to that to come out soon. Wonderful. Yeah, so I, I highly recommend anybody who's wants greater insight. Uh, if you are uh, not a survivor, you've never uh, experienced sexual abuse, uh, this book will help you understand a little bit more, I think, about what uh, people have gone through that have gone through sexual abuse and, and hopefully give us a little more empathy and insight and, and uh, um, the ability to understand at least a little bit uh, as best we can mm -hmm. of what that experience is like. And for those that have experienced it, you can hopefully make a connection here and um, be able to uh, continue healing, continue that growth and development. So, well, thank you for being You're welcome. here. Mike, <laughs> thank you for having me. It's been me. so this great. Was... We'll uh, look forward to the third one coming out and we'll come yeah. back and talk about that. All right. That sounds good. And next time we'll, we'll talk about other stuff too. We'll talk sounds about good. family and, and ministry and what else you got going on. Okay. So, Excellent. Uh,